Okay, so for this first section in effective communication as a leader, uh, the first piece I want to talk to you about is really just some basics, but a lot of things that people really get wrong a lot of time when it comes to communication and solving communication problems, fixing those communication breakdowns. And it's this really simple process. The encoding, meaning the person communicating, how are they communicating? What are the subtleties to it? How are they encoding the message to the other person? Then the noise, any sort of interference that comes to interfere with that, uh, that encoded message that the speaker is giving. And then the decoding process, which is the person you're talking to, how are they going to decode that answer or that question that whatever it is that you encoded towards them. And the reason this is a really important thing is a lot of the times our, our own personal bias gets in the way when it comes to communication. We think everybody knows the same stuff as us. We think everybody knows the same terminology. We think everybody knows the logic we're using, all of these different assumptions that we're making that uh, usually are just frankly not true. Uh, you know, I think there's a couple different examples I can go through with this. We're first, a uh, kind of fun one, uh, you know, understanding the person that you're talking to when you talk about them decoding there. You as the speaker, you need to understand who they are and how they are probably going to decode your message. Uh, it makes me think back to one of my first entrepreneurial ventures, uh, giving tours of a farm. And we were, it was a sustainable agriculture company, nonprofit, working to turn over abandoned buildings into vertical farms. If I was talking with somebody and giving them a tour and I could pick up on, you know, little subtleties when I started talking about sustainability, to put it broadly into the two buckets of, you know, left wing, left wing, right wing. If somebody was more on the right, I would start talking about the economic sustainability and how the business model worked and how it helped to develop the community and all these kind of, you know, community based economics. Right. Well, if somebody was from the left wing, you know, left end of the spectrum was in there, all they wanted to hear was how things were grown and how sustainably things were sourced and what, you know, was it organic and all these different pieces, right? I, it was the same sales pitch, the same tour that I was giving to each person that was coming through there, but understanding who I was speaking to and how they would decode that message, it was the key to being an effective communicator in that situation. So understanding how somebody decodes a message so that you can encode it in a way that they're going to understand what you're trying to communicate. I always think back to whenever I talk communication, I always think back to rugby, partially because if you listen to 10 your team uh, with Cam and Otis, uh, you've heard us talk about it a bunch that communication is like that golden answer. That's like, well, what do we need to do better, coach? Well, we need to communicate, right? And, you know, it's the reason that we joke about that in the rugby environment is because communication is so important. If you communicate better, you can fix a lot of different things. You probably can't fix everything. You know, if you can't tackle, you can't tackle. But if you communicate, you can help people to be in a better position with those kind of things. Uh, when I, when I teach people how to coach in rugby, there's this really funny thing that happens where it goes, you know, again, going back to that bias, I understand what these terms mean. I understand what a scrum rough, you know, whatever I'll throw out other rugby terms are, uh, but the person I'm teaching doesn't necessarily, you know, I can think back to literally just this last Saturday, I had, uh, an event with Engage Foundation. We had a bunch of little kids out there. One of them was this, uh, sweet little five-year-old, uh, Julian, and he was, this is his first time playing with us. And there's this really simple concept in rugby that you run forward, you pass the ball backwards, right? We talk about moving forward, talk about running straight, running at the defense, all those kind of things. I remember there was a point where little Julian was in front of me, and I handed him the ball, and I said, run straight. And he didn't go. And I was like, oh, come on, what are you doing? And then a little bit later, same kind of play. And I handed him the ball and said, hey, go that way. And, of course, he, you know, he's a little kid. He didn't really understand anyway, so he still turned and he ran the wrong way. But there's this jargon that I understand of run straight, go that way. And it's my assumption as the speaker that he understands that. Well, he didn't. It's, you know, pretty simple there. Uh, same thing goes inside of the business. You know, I think back to another one of my entrepreneurial ventures uh, where I was working in a very small team. And I was trying to be a very good, very transparent leader. And I made a mistake that a lot of leaders do, especially in a smaller organization, which is they talk too much. They share too many details and it overwhelms people. Uh, one, of, one of my uh, employees at the time, I was talking with him about basically the path of the business, where we were going, uh, you know, what could go wrong if, you know, we don't get X number of sales by this time next month, the business is gone. And I was laying it all out. And it's all real. I was being a transparent leader, which is a good thing. But the issue there was that because of who he was in the organization, he didn't understand the nuances of what I was saying. And, you know, frankly, folks, if you tell somebody in your, in your team that you might be out of business in two months if X, Y, Z doesn't happen, 
even if you know X, Y, Z is guaranteed, and then if that doesn't work, you still have L, M, N, and A, B, C, and all these different things, and you have all those contingencies, and you understand all of those nuances and all those contingencies, if your team doesn't, all they hear is, I'm losing my job in two months. That's all they care about. And so you have to understand who the person is you're talking to so that you can meet them where they are on that. Uh, you know, not withholding information in a sense of trying to keep secrets from them, but understand that if somebody's trying to do their job and, you know, you want them to focus on that job and do a really good job at it. <laughs> Sorry to repeat the word job three times in a row, but you want them to do a good job at their job. One of the things that you shouldn't be doing is confusing them with the big picture because that's your job as the leaders to understand the big picture. It's not your job. It's not everyone on the team's job to understand that necessarily. And so you have to recognize that as the leader, as the speaker, meeting them where they are and understanding what kind of information they want to hear, what kind of information they don't want to hear. And it really just goes back to understanding who that individual is, understanding your own biases, your own jargon, and then cutting out what isn't going to fit. Uh, the noise piece, that middle piece there, is really, it can be simple in some settings, it can be really complicated in others. Uh, if you're communicating one-on-one -on -one with a person and you're in a room full of people, those people create noise. Even if they're not literally talking, that changes the shape of the environment, changes the way that that person is going to decode that message because they're thinking about it from a group perspective, not just individually, if you're just sitting down one-on-one -on -one in the office. Uh, another example is depending on the medium you're using to communicate, the noise can be a little bit different. You know, uh, you, you might think I typed out an email to somebody. Well, there's no noise on it. But if you open up my Gmail tab right now and you see the hundreds of emails in there and all the different spam and all this different stuff, it's it, it, it could get lost in that noise. And it's not that your message wasn't clear enough. It's just that the noise of that medium that you chose to communicate in drowned it out. So you have to understand what the message is, how you want to communicate it, and then in that medium that you want to communicate, what is the noise that could possibly distract them? Uh, once you start to understand those three pieces, it helps you be a better communicator. And, you know, it really just goes back to understanding who the person is you're talking to, what the goal is of this communication, what is the goal that I'm trying to work towards at the end of this conversation. You should always have a goal that you're working towards, an outcome that you want to get out of that conversation. Uh, when you understand the outcome, then you can look at, you know, the medium. How do I want to handle it with this person? Do I want to talk to them in front of the entire team? Do I want to send them an email, shoot them a text, uh, pull them to the side, pull them into the office? Whatever it is that fits that desired outcome the best. And then the other piece there, understanding who they are, understanding their own biases and those kind of things, you know, being a good leader in that sense. But then you have to check your own biases. You have to understand that your jargon may not translate into it. Uh, reminds me of a story on, on a podcast a while back where we were talking with somebody about a communication pattern, actually, in this leadership thing. And basically what happened was he was going, the guest was going through, you know, X, Y, Z, his philosophy on leadership. And I was like, oh, you know, that's kind of like, uh, reminds me of a development economics. We called it asset-based community development. You know, you focus on what you have and then you build it up from there so that it's sustainable. And he goes, no, it's different. That was a breakdown of communication. What happened was we were communicating about the same thing. If you really understood what each of us were talking about, we were talking about pretty much the exact same thing. But my way of encoding and decoding the message was very different than our guest on the show. And so because neither of us were realizing that, we had a communication breakdown. A big piece of this is these communication breakdowns are going to come. The way that you get better as a leader is you ask questions, you ask for feedback with your team, and you're always analyzing these conversations once you're done with them. The better you get at reflection and you know that self-analysis and improving your own communication skills is the way that you're going to prevent those communication breakdowns in the future. Let's go back to my example on that farm when I was giving tours. You know, if I go to somebody and I start talking about environmental sustainability and they go, oh, you know, that's all fake and, blah, 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 and they go off on some tangent. Well, that's a learning lesson for me. Did I communicate our mission properly? Well, not to that person. I didn't. They didn't understand it clearly because they got upset. They thought I was talking about something else and whatever it was, whatever, whatever spiral their brain came up with. Same thing happened in the other direction, right? You have to recognize when those happen. You're going to have communication breakdowns. We're not all perfect. You know, even us leaders, we're going to make mistakes uh, and we're going to get better as we go. And that's where that reflection piece comes in. Uh, a couple couple other pieces there. Uh, in the asking for feedback, I, I got one really good trick for you. If you learn one thing from this video, uh, this this really should be it. And it's being careful about the way that you ask for feedback. Understand the framing of your questions, you know, the encoding of the question, if you will, and recognizing how the individual then decode that message. 
And I, I got uh, an example for you right here. So I'm going to ask two different versions of the question. I want you to, you know, guess to yourself. Uh, you can treat it like a door the explorer, one of those kids' cartoons. Yell it out at the screen if you want to. But which one of these is better? Option A, I finished up talking and I said, any questions? No? Okay. Or option B, what questions do you have? And then, hey, if there's still no questions, there's still no questions. But what's the difference between option A and option B there? When you ask option A, what happens is you're putting the onus on them to frankly be the stupid person in the conversation. Nobody wants to feel stupid, especially if you're in a group setting. They don't want to feel like they don't know what's happening. You know, talking about rugby earlier, this happens all the time with rugby. You know, it's that whole old adage of if you have a question, if you're confused about something, someone else in the team is probably confused about it too. But so often we get so stuck in the group that we get scared to ask those kind of questions. So when you as the leader say any questions, you're basically asking, it, any, anyone not get this? Anyone not understand this? Anyone so stupid that they didn't understand what I was talking about? And they need questions to clarify it? That's not what you mean. That's definitely not what you mean if you're a good leader. But that's how people read it a lot of the time is it's forcing them, putting the onus on them to raise their hand and ostracize themselves from the rest of the group. So how do you reframe that? What questions do you have? I know you have questions. I know you have questions. So ask them. And then you create a dialogue with your team where you're having them ask questions. That's where you really get to the, you know, effective communication is just by actually creating that good dialogue, not just me speaking to you and you understanding, but you asking questions back to me so that we can expand our knowledge and expand our understanding of this subject area through those questions. And uh, a couple little tricks with it. Uh, these all honestly come out from uh, rugby coaching, but they apply great inside of the business environment as well. One of those is as you go through, it helps to pull quite when you're getting those questions from people trying to pull those questions from people. One of the tricks besides that phrasing that I talked about a second ago, uh, the other trick to it is to leave rooms for questions intentionally. Meaning, let's say there's 10 points you're covering, and there's probably gonna be questions besides those other 10 points. You almost want to leave one obvious point out and then leave that as a question. You know, uh, to take a rugby example, if I'm setting up a drill. And, you know, it's, we're in a square and if you go out of the square, you're out. I don't mention that part of the game. I, that's, that's, there's a square. You got to stay inside the square. Then somebody will go, what happens to you outside of the square? There you go. Great question. If you go outside the square, you are out. But I, what I'm doing is I'm training the team to understand that they need to ask those questions. That I'm not always going to give them all that information. And what, it, what that really goes back to is teaching the team, training the team, in order to have that inquisitive mindset where they're going to ask those kind of qu clarifying questions. If you are the any questions, no, good kind of leader, then they're never going to ask those questions. And even when they are really confused, they're genuinely struggling with what you're talking about. It doesn't matter. They're not going to ask those questions because they're scared about being ostracized from the rest of the team, from the rest of the group. So the other key there, the other little trick I'll give you is that when you're working with people, you're trying to get answers from them. You want to pull answers, not push. And what that means is I don't want to set them up in a way where they're just filling in the blank in my sentence. You know, uh, what happened, you know, talking about running out of bounds inside of the game, right? Well, if you run out of bounds, what do you think happens? Well, I'm kind of setting up, I'm kind of laying it right out there that they're going to pull the answer from me. Uh, and, you know, also the, or sorry, I'm pushing the answer onto them rather. Uh, same can, think, kind of thing can happen inside the business setting. You know, we're talking about what our goals are. And instead of really asking what the goals are, I'm more telling what the goals are. Uh, pulling is basically leaving it to open-ended questions. Pushing is usually going to be a binary answer, yes or no. Do you think this? Yes. Okay, good. Right answer. We're all on the same page. But when you pull, you, you're training them again to have that inquisitive way of thinking about things, that critical thinking that is so important to the innovation, to the culture inside of a team. And so what you need to do is pull that answer from them. Even if it is the most obvious thing ever, it's a square. I told you to stay inside of the square. What happens if you're outside of the square? Instead of just trying to push that onto them, you know, and trying to convince them to just say that yes, no answer, you want to leave that open and have it be something that it could be anything. And then you answer that question from them. And again, it goes back to building that pattern where they are comfortable asking those questions. They're going to continue to ask those questions. So quick recap on it to go through those tips. Don't push answers onto people, pull answers from people. Give them open-ended questions so that they can, uh, so they can actually think about and practice those critical thinking skills that you want your team to have. 
The other piece there, don't say any questions. Never say any questions. Say, what questions do you have? Flip the scripts that there are already questions. You're not putting the onus on them to raise their hand and ostracize themselves from the group. And then the last piece, just going through that process of encoding, understanding the noise and the medium that you're communicating through, and then the decoding process that that other person is going through. Once you understand those individual pieces, you can identify where the communication is breaking down and you can start to fix that. But that goes back to one of those other pieces we talked about, which is that self-reflection aspect. The only way you're going to get better as a leader, whether it's communication or any other aspect, is by looking at what you did and learning from those failures, learning from those mistakes, and continuing to iterate so you can get better and better as a leader. So I hope this helps you to communicate more effectively as a leader inside of your team, whether it's rugby or in business. Uh, and, you know, if you're watching this in GBLP, we have a lot more great communication tools for you coming up in these next sections. And if you're watching this for free on YouTube, a free excerpt from the Green Beret Leadership Program, and you enjoyed this and you want to learn more about GBLP, then go to 10xyourteam.net. Learn more about GBLP and the other programs that we have to offer for you that are going to help you to become a better leader and develop great leaders inside of your team.